Hi, I'm professional photographer Paul Miguel. Uh, this video is all about exposure, so I'm going to be helping you to understand exposure and how you can get perfectly exposed images in your wildlife shots. So the way that your exposure meter is working is basically recording the light that's bouncing off the subject and coming back through the lens onto the sensor. So you've got three things basically regulating the light that's coming into the camera. You've got your aperture, you've got your shutter speed and you've also got the ISO. And those three things combined are going to regulate how much light hits the sensor. It's really important to understand how what's in the viewfinder affects your exposure. So basically every time you frame an image, whatever's in the viewfinder, that's where the camera is taking its exposure reading from. So whatever is in the viewfinder, light bouncing back, and that's where it's taking its reading. There are different metering modes on the camera. So you've got a center weighted, partial, evaluative, and they will all meter slightly differently. Center will take more of the exposure reading from the center of the frame. The evaluative one, will try to take everything in the viewfinder and kind of average it out and give you what it thinks is the correct exposure. You may also have spot metering. So this is where you can take a exposure reading from a very small area using a focus point. So that can be useful. These days I just use evaluative metering mode and then any compensation I add as necessary. If you are using AV or TV, the semi-automatic modes, then that can be really good and particularly in changeable light but it's still going to be affected by what's in your viewfinder. So again, if the background's particularly light or dark, it's going to affect the exposure. So if the light's consistent, it can be much better to use manual. And in this case, you can take a reading off something neutral, such as green grass or a very deep blue sky, take a meter reading off that, get your exposure meter in the middle, and then use that as your base reading. So it might not be bang on. Use that as a basis for your exposure, take a test shot, and then adjust the exposure slightly to get the result. This technique works really, really well on sunny days when you're photographing birds in flight. So rather than let the camera deal with the exposure, you can, again, take a reading off a neutral subject, set the exposure manually, and then basically wherever the bird flies, if it goes against the light background, blue sky, dark area, the exposure's not gonna change, it's locked in. Your exposure's gonna be the same every time. So what about the histogram? How useful is the histogram? Um, it's something that you don't have to use all the time, I would say, but I do find it a very useful tool. Uh, it's particularly useful on really bright sunny days where it's very difficult to see the screen on the back of your camera. The histogram will always give you a much more accurate representation of your exposure. So here's an example of a histogram. And the way to read it is that the left-hand side of the histogram is the darkest tones in your image. The right hand side is the lightest tones in your image. So left to right on the graph goes from dark to light. And the actual height tells you how much of each tone there is in that particular picture. So if there is a big peak on the left hand side, there'd be a lot of dark areas. If there was a big peak on the right hand side, there'd be a lot of light areas. So in this image, it's quite a mixture. So the most important thing to understand about histograms is that they should not all look the same. Don't think they should all be a nice curve or they should be in the middle. Your histogram is basically a digital representation of what is in your photograph. So if you've got a picture that is very dark overall, then the left hand side is going to have a big peak. If you've got an image that's got a lot of light tones in it, it's going to have a big peak at the right hand side. If it's a mixture, it's probably in a landscape image, you're probably going to have a lot of different tones in there and you're going to get quite an evenly distributed curve. So in this image, the histogram's fairly neutral. It's not got a really big peak at the left hand side or at the right hand side. The pixels are a bit more evenly distributed. Now a lot of the time you're shooting, the surroundings just aren't neutral at all. So a very common situation is where the background is actually quite light. Maybe it's a blank sky or you're shooting towards quite light water. So what happens is the camera will reduce the exposure because um, it doesn't think it needs to give as much light and that'll cause underexposure. So to counteract that, you need to deliberately overexpose from what the camera is telling you, often by around plus two thirds or plus one stop.
The opposite is also true, where if you leave it to the camera sometimes in dark situations, the subject can come out too bright. In this case, you need to override that by dialing in some minus compensation. And the other main reason I would say to use the histogram is when it comes to photographing whites. So anything white, such as swans or gannets, for example, yeah, you want to make sure that you don't blow out the detail. with the swan taking up a reasonable part of the frame but it's not too close the camera's taking a lot of the exposure from the surrounding area as well as the bird so it's actually ended up overexposing we can actually see that the histogram's gone off the end of the graph on the right hand side there's more information there and we also know that that's true because it's flashing here I've got highlight alert enabled and the whitest areas are actually flashing so this is overexposed you might have an option on your camera for highlight alert as i do on my canon and basically when this is switched on um, if any of the highlights are blown out then the camera will flash on those areas and it'll tell you that that's overexposed so that's a useful indication mine switched on most of the time um, those highlight areas flashing also called blinkies if you're in america in this image we're a little bit closer, so the camera is taking more of the exposure reading from the bird. And actual fact, this exposure looks just about perfect to me. If we look at the right hand side of the histogram, we can see that it's not off the end and it's not too close to the end. We've got a reasonable gap there and the whites are looking fairly accurate. So again it can be difficult to tell from your screen, look at your histogram and look on the right hand side and if it looks like any of the graph has gone right off the end then you've overexposed the image and the details blown out, you've blown out the highlights. You want to make sure there's ideally a bit of a gap towards the end of your histogram, maybe just into that fifth box. And here where I've got in much closer, so now the white bird's filling the frame. So the camera's taking most of the exposure reading from the actual bird, from the white plumage. That's causing it to reduce the exposure. And in this case, it's probably reduced the exposure a little bit too much. Thanks for watching this tutorial. I think exposure probably is one of the hardest things in wildlife photography. So I really hope this video made it a little bit easier to understand. If you haven't subscribed, please click on subscribe. And if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you next time. You'll probably have different exposure modes. You'll have P, which is program, which is more of an automatic setting where it's changing settings at the same time. Aperture priority, AV on Canon, where you are essentially in control of the aperture and the camera automatically changes the shutter speed. Shutter priority, TV on Canon. Here you're in control of the shutter speed and the camera is automatically changing the aperture to match it. And then you have completely manual. So here you're in control of the aperture and the shutter speed and you can change them both independently as you want. On all these settings, you could choose to change the ISO manually to get the exposure you want. Auto ISO can also be used in these exposure modes. If you're on aperture priority on auto ISO, the shutter speed will change first and then when the shutter speed gets to a certain point, the ISO will increase. If you're using shutter priority, then the aperture will change first. When it can't get to a wider aperture, then the ISO will increase. On manual, you're able to select the aperture and the shutter speed as you want them, and then the ISO will fluctuate accordingly. If you're using auto ISO, you will need to set a minimum ISO and a maximum ISO, and also probably set a minimum shutter speed as well.